if we recognize the call of God, we raise up, we impart, we train, we do what we're doing here, and then we release. Yeah, that's good, yeah. And we've got to open our hands and let and risk with some people in the context of leadership and some of those things. We'll talk about that in a yeah, minute. But it's recognize, raise up, release. Recognize, impart, call out, and then open your hand. Yeah. Right? But we've got to be very sure of that. Because when I, when it comes to something like... Are you right there, bud? Yeah. <laughs> um, when we, uh, when we recognize the call of God, that really is what we're doing, right? We're recognizing the call of God in your life. And so the, this, is, this is the challenge sometimes, right? It gets funny because it's like actually now we've recognized the call of God and we've, and we've tried and trained and imparted and then we open our hand and then it gets hard yeah. and then people get mad with me. Yeah. And I'm like, wait, I didn't call you. If life gets hard and ministry gets hard, you've got to take that up with the Lord because I didn't call you. I recognize the call of God in your life. That's it. Yeah. And then I wanted to impart and train and create opportunity for you. Yeah. Does, that, does that make sense? Uh, listen, I, I, we're all laughing. I'm telling you now, that happens. People get mad with me. Yeah. And I'm like, never promised you a rose garden. I should be singing that. <laughs> God calls, I recognize the call, and then we open a door. Are you doing all right? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Could you go over the, the four, like, what your plan is to go over? Four cities? Yeah. Full parishes. What's the activity today? Today? No, for the, yeah, just recap it again. All right, just call character capacity is what we're going to try and cover tonight. I don't know that we're going to get all the way there, but call character capacity. Okay, so we dealt with the call. Uh, but let me tell you, there's also freedom in understanding the call of God. Yeah. There's also liberty in it, right? I, I, one of the things that God spoke to me very, very early on in my ministry was this, Moses, a servant of the Lord. And I felt God take me to that scripture and, and read it over me, literally, TK, a servant of the Lord. And there's liberty in that because God's called me, I serve God, who God asks me to serve is people. Now there's liberty in that because it makes God my master, not people. Yeah. Are you doing all right? When we yeah. get that wrong, when it's like, hey, people are my master. Everybody's telling me what to do. Yeah. Everybody, you know, yeah. everybody's got a wonderful plan for my life and tell me exactly how I should be leading the church and what I should be doing. I'm like, okay, actually, yeah. I'm a servant of the Lord. Yeah. Are, are you doing all right? Yeah. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 9, you know I quote this often, we make it our goal to please Him. Let me tell you, one of the challenges of leadership, and it's a, it's, a, it's a real challenge. I think I'm off my notes already, but it's a real challenge is to go to sleep every night knowing you've disappointed somebody. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and I don't try to, but I have to make calls. I have to make governmental calls. I have to make decisions about things. Yeah. Not because I want to be the big shot, because it's what God has called me to at this time in this season. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And... I have to know 2 Corinthians 5 verse 9. I make it my goal to please Him. Yeah. I, 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 I can lay my head on the pillow knowing I've disappointed somebody. I don't want to lay my head on the pillow knowing I've disappointed the Lord. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? <clears throat> you doing okay? Yeah. Please feel free to ask questions and shout out. And yeah, sure. So it's who called us and then there's what God has called us to, right? I love how Paul often says he's called to be a servant. I love what Lydia said right in the beginning there, right? It's like, actually, we call to serve. Moses, a servant of the Lord. Paul, called to be a servant. Set apart for the gospel. You doing okay? I've often said this, if serving is below you, leading is beyond you, right? There is no path to leadership that excludes service and sacrifice. There is no path to service. I mean, no path to leadership that doesn't include service and sacrifice. Lord challenged me as a young leader on this thing. And, and you know, I, I, I was very young. We'll talk a little bit about my journey in a little while. I, I, was, I was very young as a leader. And, and it's easy to fall in love with what you do. Yeah. <clears throat> and I started to love my preaching. I started to love preaching. Leading the church already, so you are preaching every week. And this is what I felt God Ask me this question. If I never allow you to speak another word in my name, 
will you still love me the same? Well, I'm still yelling, aren't I? <laughs> he hasn't asked, he hasn't answered your question. Yeah. <laughs> <Still>. <laughs> people say this to me. I often hear people say that to me. You love preaching. And sometimes I do. I don't always love it. Sometimes I do. I actually prefer this. I prefer training. I prefer these smaller forums than anything else. Yeah. Sometimes people say you love leading. And like, sometimes. Sometimes I do. What I long for is to serve God. What I long for is faithfulness and fruitfulness in any season, in any capacity, yeah. in any way. Yeah. You know, when we, we led the church in Los Angeles and then uh, we merged with another church, I wasn't the lead guy, but I was freed up to travel more into Mexico and then came here to, to join Ty. <clears throat> it was 10 years. And I'd led churches all the while up till then. There was a 10-year period, the five years in Los Angeles, five years here under Ty's leadership that I didn't lead. And I'll tell you what, I didn't miss it for one second. Because it's not about leading for me, it's about fruitfulness. It's about being fruitful in any and every situation, in every, in every circumstance. I felt like I was serving God and producing fruit. Sandy and I, on the eldership with Ty, we oversaw and led nine ministries in the life of the church. And that, so there's fruit and there's engagement and that's the craving, not to be the big shot, not to be the lead guy. Are you doing okay? Yeah. We can fall in love with our gift. We can worship our gift. But we are only called to love and worship one. And that's the one who gave his life for us. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> David's a great example for us of a young man called by God, right? He's a servant, he's a shepherd, and he's a leader. And I think that's the lesson for us. The lesson is in where David was found. Yeah, they come and ask for all the kids and he goes, well, because the prophet's been told, one of your kids is the next leader of Israel, next king of Israel. And he goes and they march all the kids and he's like, there's not one of them. Do you have any other kids? Not even his own father thought to call David. Overlooked by man, not even his own father when the prophet said, bring all your sons before me. Not even his own father saw leadership in him. And then 1 Samuel 16 verse 11 says, there is still the youngest one, but he's tending the sheep. Yeah. There's a lesson in that. And soon after this, he is the one. <clears throat> I'm convinced of this growing up in Africa, spent a lot of years hunting, hunted a lot of animals, seen a lot of animals. I'm convinced of this. Sheep might be one of the most vulnerable animals ever. They're not particularly fast. They don't have good hearing, good eyesight. They just like it's just a fluffy, it's a fluffy snack. Just a fluffy snack for any predator, right? And yet, that's most often how God describes His people, Old Testament and New. But we see this every time in Scripture. We see sheep without a shepherd. It's seen as negative, it's seen as weak, and it's seen as a vulnerability. Yeah, wow. Jesus describes people as sheep without a shepherd. He describes them as harassed and helpless. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you doing okay? Yeah. Frank Damazio leads a big church, I think, in the northwest somewhere. The heart of a shepherd is the closest thing to the heart of God for his church. A shepherd's heart is a required attitude for all leadership ministries, especially governmental ministries. Moses 27 verse 15, Moses said to the Lord, May the Lord, the God who gives breath to all living things, appoint someone over this community to go out and come in before them. Leadership by example. To go out and come in before them. One who will lead them out and bring them in so that the Lord's people will not be like sheep without a shepherd. <coughs> Numbers, <laughs> numbers. Did I say Moses? Yeah, oh, sorry. I was so confused. I was like, I haven't read that book. I wrote it down, Moses. Numbers twenty. You wrote it down. Sorry, Numbers twenty-seven, verse fifteen. Moses said to the Lord, "You doing okay? Yeah. Are you doing? I don't know. We're gonna find out, bro." 
Well done, We're going to find out. Just the test to see if you're you doing okay? Yeah. Good. The, the, call of, the call of God is critical for us to understand, man. It, it, re, it really is. I, uh, th- there was a guy that I, that I would meet with in, in Wichita regularly, and this guy was such an incredible worship leader. But he was convinced God had called him to be an apostle. And I was like, I just I try to help him, not to be unkind, but I try to help him and just be like, bro, you are such an incredible worship leader, you know, to the point that I said, I've been around a number of apostles. I don't, I don't think you are one. I'm trying to be as kind as I can. Just, you know, do you know what I mean? Just not yeah. trying to be a jerk, trying to help the guy. Mm-hmm. And he just wouldn't hear it. Mm-hmm. And today he's not even in ministry anymore. Maybe two years after that conversation, he wasn't in ministry anymore. And I'm like, bro, if you would have just understood your calling, understood your gifting, and been settled in that. Yeah, right? Yeah, you know what I'm saying? It's like, don't try and be something you're not, you know. Yeah. Mm. Um, if, we, if we get there later, we might get there. But it's Saul's armor. You know, David, like we said, he's a servant, he's a shepherd. I mean, they, and when he says, I'll go out and fight Goliath, they put Saul's armor on him, right? Mm. And Saul, listen, Saul was a big man. We, we've said that before, right? The Bible describes him as somebody who stood head and shoulders above everybody else. He was the tallest, biggest guy in Israel. He should have been the guy to fight Goliath. So they put Saul's armor on him and give him Saul's sword. And he tries to walk around in them. He's like, I can't go in these things. So he takes the armor off, puts the sword down. And it's interesting, the scripture says it like this. The the scripture says he took five stones and put them in his shepherd's bank and went out and faced Goliath. It's like we will defeat our Goliaths in our calling, not in something else. Does it make sense? It's like I'm trying to be something else. Listen, I, I, I do have an overactive imagination. I understand that. I'm convinced of this. If David went out in Saul's armor, that story ends differently. Because yeah. he can't hardly move. He's walking around, the, the armor's too big for him, the sword's nine feet long. But he goes out in his calling. He goes out in that shepherd boy anointing. Five smooth stones in his shepherd's bag and he defeats Goliath. You doing okay? Yeah. Settling that thing of, of, of we are called of God and then secondly, what we are called to. Is a big deal for us. You alright? Yeah. Yes. Any thoughts, any comments, any questions before we move on? That's huge, Steve, because I mean, it's a text in Second Peter 2 or 5 where it's just like... I just quoted Moses, bro, so it doesn't yeah. really matter that you quote the scripture accurately. So <laughs> <laughs> I just quoted the book of Moses. Second Peter 1. Second Peter 1, it's like make, make your calling and election sure. Yeah. There's nothing worse than someone who, first of all, hasn't settled that they're called by God, but also yeah. is so on the fence about what they're calling is. Yeah. It's like you're just, it, you're almost like a, like a dandelion waiting to be like picked out of like real, absolutely, real ne- uh, shallow foundation. And listen, call, calling can be natural and it can be unnatural. I'm telling you now, my, the call of God on my life is unnatural, so we could say supernatural. Yeah. I'll just. Because I, I am a loner. I, I love to be on my own. And I, I always say I can deal with people in, in short bursts. And I, I mean that. I mean, sometimes you're on a ministry trip and it's two or three weeks. It's like, okay, but when I'm done with that, I need to be on my own. Yeah. You know, I, I'm a reluctant leader. When I'm in a leadership position, I lead strongly and clearly, hopefully. But I'm never the person to put my hand up. Never. And that's what I said. I was 10 years. And it didn't bother me for one split second. And so it's that thing of like you can want something, but you're not called to it. Because you want it doesn't mean you're called to it. Yeah, good. Right? And sometimes you can not want something and be called to it. Yeah. Yeah. Right? You hear me say this often. I'm a loner and I'm a homebody. Like how am I involved in something that has thousands of people all over the world? How did that? Do you know what I'm saying? I want to stay home and drink my tea in my cup. That's, if you gave me, but that's not what God's called me to. Yeah. So you respond to the call of God, even if it's unnatural for you. Yeah. Does, that make, does that make sense? 
Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Is that my time? It's closing prayer. <laughs> Catherine's time. Catherine's like, oh, I can only take 20 minutes of this guy. No, don't worry. She has an alarm set for go to sleep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 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 So that's another story. <laughs> so, let me, so, so let me ask you, let me ask you something. Let me ask you something else real quick. What about, what about calling intention? So... Um, so let me say, I don't, know, I don't know how to give an example without giving it away right up front. I think one of the, and, and this is honestly one of the, and I was, I was serving on team already and traveling, we just had blue. Um, and I can remember a lady saying to me, God's just called me to be a mother to my children. And straight up at the time, it was probably one of the most offensive things anybody had said to me. Because I'm like, are you telling me God hasn't called me to be a father to my children? You understand what I'm saying? So there's, there's, like, what is that? Where's that tension? Yeah. Do, do you know what I'm saying? So it's like, yeah, I'm called to ministry. That doesn't mean I leave my kids behind. Yeah. Or oh, I'm called... Well, there's that scripture that says leave your kids behind. No, there isn't. That's the point. <laughs> no, there isn't. <laughs> but we do have plenty of examples of it. Not scripture, but we do have plenty of examples. But it's that thing as well, right? It's like, so... But then also, do I leave ministry until my kids are grown? I don't do either one. There's a tension in those things. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So there can, be a, there can be calling intention, right? It can't just be like, hey, I'm doing this. I'm not doing anything else. Yeah, yeah. It's like, actually, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. God's opened an amazing door for, for Jordan to go to school, but she knows she's still called to be a worship leader, knows she's still called to Redemption City Church. It's been fascinating to have some of those conversations with her, eh, Jordan. So it's not one or the other. I'm called to do this, so nothing else gets done. No, there's always these things, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, good. Does it make sense? Yeah. You okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Too bad. Sorry. <laughs> 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 ask a question then. Do you have a question? I have a question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> we're just, so just, we're trying to get that call intention. Just, yeah, I, I mean, I, does, does it make does it make sense though? I mean, yeah, it's very good to. Yeah. It's like you can't. I don't. I don't just know anybody that's just called to one thing. Yeah, yeah that's true. You, you know what I mean? Um, and so it's just not. It's just not that simple. But when it comes to ministry or leadership or business or whatever, then that's where we understand that thing. Yeah, yeah that's very good. You know. If you've got a wife or a husband, there's calling involved in that too. Yeah. As Russ so graciously pointed out. <clears throat> Russ made me look bad out there in the coffee thing. I was, I was talking about like, I don't like my food too hot. And he's like, you know what I do when Amy brings me food? I just say, thank you for the food, Amy. I don't argue about it being too hot, too cold. <laughs> Yep. I think the way I, I kind of understand it is when I was a young lady, I knew that at the age of 19 that God had called me into ministry in, in whatever leadership position he wanted me to step in. When the door opened up, I stepped in. So then I get married or I meet this man, and I have to know that... I <laughs> thought that sentence was going to end differently. I meet this man... <laughs> I have to know my calling hasn't changed, yeah. but that God has equally yoked me with yeah. a man that yeah. has a yeah. similar, that has the calling same. like I have. Mm -hmm. Then I have children. I have to understand as a mother, I'm still called to do what God has called me to That's do cool. first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I bring my family in as team, yeah. as part of that calling, Good. as, hey, God has called us to be an apostolic household. So I remember sitting with... Um, Shanae, the one said, she was just weeping. Why do you have to go again? Why do you have to go again? 
And um, I just sat with her, and I mean, we always walked the tension and did, you know, never wanted our children to suffer, but also understood God's called us to go. Mm. And had to sit with her and say, Shane, God has called us to be part of it, you to be part of an apostolic household. Mm. Let's talk that through. And so I bring her into it and allow her to understand she's part of this calling. She's part of the team. Yeah, God has called us as a team. So it just seemed like the call never changed. It was just like bringing whoever, my children, you know, each child along with us. Even when we were called to move to different nation, we brought the children in and we asked them to pray about it, to be part of the decision to to let us know what is God saying mm -hmm. to them because yeah. they're part of the team. And so I yes. think it's more that than, um, oh, okay, now I'm a mom, so that's from yeah. me. Okay, Lord, yeah, well, good. I know you've called me, but I'm a mom now. This is my call. My no, actually, I still called you to be that, plus I've called you yeah. to be a mom. Yeah. And it's this capacity yeah. thing that TK yeah, speaks yeah. about. You know, just, I mean, that reminded me of something else, right? I mean, we... Yeah. You know, we, we were on an apostolic team when we had our kids. And in those days, it, you, the expectation was that you were gone two weekends a month. Good. That was the expectation. Plus three international team meetings a year. Mm -hmm. and, and we had just had blue. And um, I can remember, you know, one, one, I came back from, from one of the trips and one of my elders said to me, man, you've got to travel less, you know. Um, you don't see blue when you're not here. You don't. You only see him when you're here. You don't see what he's like when you're not here. And I, I, so I called Dudley, who was leading the team then, and I'm like, Dudley, this, you know, it's one of my elders. It's not something I can just laugh off. So one of my elders have said that to me. What, what, what do you think? You know, what, what, have you got any thoughts for me? And he just said this. He said, Do you believe if God gave you the grace to step onto apostolic team, he would leave your kids without the grace for you to be on team? And I said, That doesn't sound like the father I serve. He's called me and graced me. He's going to grace my kids for that call as well. Does that make sense? So it's not just like, anyway, let's move on. Uh, Matthew, this better be a good question, boy. Hopefully. <laughs> um, <I feel> like. <laughs> so, Maybe I shouldn't ask questions. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, so what you said earlier where, like you were talking about Daniel and how he had like his little shepherd's bag or whatever. David. 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 Yeah, that one. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, like you said, that spoke to like him knowing his calling. And then you were talking obviously in terms of yourself about how it almost contrasts to your personality as of what God has called you yep. to, to these churches. How do you think... Um, that like calling connects <coughs> or contrasts to personality like that. Like, do you think um, you kind of unlock a, a word for it? Uh, but I, th I think, and that's what I mean. That's was the point. I think. I think call calling can work with who you are, and calling can contradict who you are. Mm -hmm. It it can be both ways. Stretchy, yeah. You know what I'm saying? It can be like, hey, this is a people person, so <coughs> God can call you and use you with people. But God can also call somebody that doesn't, that is a loner and... Like a Gideon in the Bible. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I don't, I don't think it's either or, Matt. The, the point there is being clear about your calling and allowing, I think, allowing your calling to override your personality type. If, if your personality type tends towards comfort and convenience. Yeah. Does that make sense? Because I, 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 know what, I know what's convenient for me and I know what's comfortable for me. But God's called me out of that. Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah? Can I chime in on that? Yes, sir. Yeah, I think, it's, I think there's a part of that where the Lord sees, Lord sees who he has called you to be. Yeah, not in very your good. current condition necessarily. Very good. So depending on what your current condition is, not that that is bad in any way, shape, or form, yeah. there, the delta, the change between what he's called you to be to where you are and maybe what your personal preferences are, Maybe great, maybe small, maybe uncomfortable, maybe not so uncomfortable. Yeah. Wow. And he's focused on this, like what he has called you to be, to mm. be, do his good work that he has mm. sent you apart to do. 
Mm. Yeah. And he's constantly working to get you there. Mm. And that process to get you there is very good. More or less uncomfortable depending upon oh. where you are and what he's called you yeah. to do. Yeah. That's correct, yeah. yeah. I think it's such a key thing, like I mean, it's been said over and over again, but just that second Peter one thing, it's like everything should flow from your calling. And that's why you have to make your calling and elect sure because mm. Everything should flow from that, otherwise you burn out. Yeah, if absolutely. God hasn't called you to do it, yep. then that's where burnout comes because it's yeah. there's no grace for it, like yep. we were talking about before. And you, God hasn't given you a heart or even called you to be stretched in that. And place. then you are fighting in Saul's armor, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah, and you know, it's, I, I've I've had I've had some conversations like this. You know, you know. But, you know, when we went through this apostolic expansion where we were planting churches all over the world, and I can remember having conversations with guys in South Africa going, I don't have the grace to go to India. I was like, you live in South Africa. Why would you need the grace to go to India? If God's called you to India, and you get to India, you'll have the grace. Yeah. And it's like sometimes we want the grace to kind of precede that, and I think that's what you're talking about, Ben. It's like that like delta. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's the stepping out of the boat. It's the walking into something that you're not comfortable with. It's not convenient. That you, you, you know what I'm saying? And it's in that place that the grace of God comes. Yeah, it's what Sandy said about Gideon, right? Yeah. When the angel approached Gideon, she said, mighty warrior. Yeah. He's literally hiding yeah. from his Cowering. enemies, threshing wheat in a wine press. Yeah. He's the opposite in that yeah. moment. Yeah. All of his actions are the opposite of a mighty warrior. Exactly. But he's calling us to where, calling us out of the wine press and towards what he's called us to. Yeah. Very good. So, <laughs> something, something I know Dad has always worked with us on is this thing of calling is almost like getting with God an identity which leads to grasping the call of God in your life. Do you think that's an accurate way of going about it? Because to me, what that's always created in my head is, is uh, see who God's made me to be and know what he's called me to do. But to me, that's always meant okay, see my, the strengths he's given me and that's going to line up with the call. But. Well, I think sometimes and sometimes not. I really, I really do. And that's what I'm saying. I think sometimes God can work with your personality. And we're talking about personality now, not character, right? Yeah. Those, are, those are two different things. Yeah. Integrity, credibility, those are character issues. Yeah. But who you are, you can be a people person, you can be gregarious, you can love to stand up in front of people. And God, God can work with that, or God can take somebody that is a bit quieter, etc. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? And still ask Him to do those things. And then you step into it because it's the call of God on your life, not because that's what you are naturally gifted for. Does that, does that help? So I think those two things go hand in hand, Matt, to be honest with you. Because I do think God can change your identity. That's to Ben's point. You know what I mean? It's like, and, and we've often said this in leadership. Leadership is more about calling and parenting as well it's more about calling stuff out than it is about hammering stuff in and so what do you read and that comes back to that thing of recognizing the call of god so we recognize the call of god and we call it out yeah. does that make sense so i think it can i think uh, but I, I think god can work with or outside of your personality mm -hmm. and when you talk about identity and then call i think often those two things can can go together as long as they don't get mixed up out in, in the context of I only have value before God for what I do. Yeah, that's, that's when identity yeah. and calling can hurt us. Yeah. Because if I'm in that place that is, that is and, and you've heard me say this often, I, I separate my devotional time and my study time. Yeah. Because when I get up in the morning, I have my devotional time, my, my prayer, my posture before God there is, I'm, I'm your son, you my father. I want to hear my father's voice. I'll get to Redemption City Church later. I'll get to sermon prep later. So my primary identity before God is as a son. Yeah. Does that make sense? If you get that confused, and that's, and that's, I think, sometimes when we see people get insecure is when their position changes. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? It's like, I'm not going to lead this church forever. My position is going to change up pretty quick. But it's not. It's like if I'm if I'm not secure in that thing of sonship, then when my position changes, I'm like I'm useless. I'm just a worm. Does it make sense? And you can't because your value is as a son. So I've got a number of hands going up. You first, then you, then you. Yes. I mean, I was just uh, to kind of what Matt was talking about. I 
it made me think of like Moses and you know God was like called him to go you know lead his people called him to you know deliver them from Pharaoh and you know you look at him before he does all that he's he's a stutterer you know he's yeah. not comfortable with talking and you know it's just so interesting that you know he God took someone who was not like a great speaker yeah yep. and that wasn't one of their strengths and he didn't want to go and lead people and he's, and to go and speak to this mighty man like Pharaoh you know this like person that you think yeah. is like so crazy yeah. um, and it's just and the, and the question that I felt like God was asking me was like if I call you to something that is you know <clears throat> not your strength and is a weakness yeah. how much more are you going to press it than you need for that yeah. Um, yeah. you know because if, if I'm I have a strength of something if, if Moses was a good talker he would have just gone in with the confidence of oh I can talk my way through this yeah. but because he yeah. wasn't he had to yeah. really press into God and he was reluctant right he didn't want it he really didn't. It's like take Aaron's more qualified. This what about this guy? What about that guy? But actually it was the call of God. And then when he steps in, you see him lead clearly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Talking about what Matt was saying, like maybe, you know, what he's wondering about has more to do with like nature versus nurture as well. Like our nature sometimes gets buried, like our identity sometimes gets buried by the way the world shapes us. Mm -hmm. And so I learned later on in life God showed me that I'm actually more of an extrovert but I was conditioned to become more introverted mm -hmm. and so and also I interpreted my insecurities as introversion mm -hmm. like I when I was in my, in my teens and 20s I was really anxious to be around people but it was actually more coming out of a place of insecurity and mm -hmm. fear and not necessarily who I am as a person mm -hmm. and so if we're facing weaknesses, it must not be actually stuff that's part of our character, but rather the enemy assignment to oh, carry us, yep. carry who we really are. No, absolutely. Yeah, very good. Yes, sir. I, I had a question about call and just calling, and there's just a lot of young guys here, so it's like a lot. Is calling, do you see it as a future thing, or is it a present tense? I think it's both. I think it's both. I, th I think it is because it is now and sometimes even just understanding the call of God on your life will lead you to put some disciplines in place and so what you say yes to, what you say no to, as God calls you. Yeah, that's Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, let's move on to character real quick. You doing okay? Yeah, good. 1 Timothy 3 verse 1 to 15, we all know that chapter. Um, I'm sure we've all read it. Um, so all the qualifications for eldership. It's interesting when you read those qualifications for eldership, right? It's like, actually, this is just normal Christianity. When you read those things, right? Because it's husband of one wife. Does that mean a normal Christian can have two wives? <laughs> Don't be angry. Does that mean a normal Christian can show up angry every Sunday? <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? It's just, yeah. you know what I mean? It's just, actually, when you read it, it's actually just like normal Christianity, to be honest with you. And most of those things are about character, right? Most of those qualifications are character qualifi qualifications rather than gifting qualifications. Yeah. And I think sometimes we can lean on gifting, right? We can, we can lean on gifting rather than character. But all of these qualifications are about character. But I also want to say this. They, when you read the scriptures, these are the qualifications for leadership, not the disqualifications. What do I mean by that? If you read that and you're not that and you know God's called you to, that's an invitation to work on that thing before God. Yeah, yeah, good. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's not a disqualification. It's like actually God wants to qualify us in these areas. Mm -hmm. And then it's just an invitation for me to say, okay, I am this, I am that. Yeah. God, will you work on me and yeah. change that about me so that I can be qualified? Good. Is that okay? Yeah. There's also this reality, friends, and... In business and politics, sometimes you can lead without character. You can be a womanizer and a cheat and whatever in business and get away with it, in politics and get away with it. You can't do that in the kingdom of God. That doesn't work in the church. Are you doing it right? Not for long, at least. Not for long, exactly. Yeah, well, unfortunately, unfortunately, there are, there are, movements, denominations, whatever, that will gloss over those things, you know, or just move the guy around. You know what I mean? It's, or 
he's just not accountable to anybody. And so he can be a local independent guy and have an affair, whatever, and shut that church down and move to the town down the street and fire up another church. You know? And they're, they're big names that if I mentioned them, you'd all know them that have done that. It's not, it's not God's will. While scripture is a lens, it is a lens. I, I think a scripture is, is a lens that we should look at the world through. Right? We should, we should develop. I think as leaders, we should put a high priority on developing a biblical worldview. Yeah. Right? What, what, what do I mean like that? And what do I mean by that? Do we see the Russia-Ukraine crisis through the lens of scripture or simply what the increased gas price means to me? Do you understand what I'm saying? It's like, actually, there's a biblical worldview. I've got to look at Scripture through that thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Rather than, gee, well, this is, what it always, this is what it means to me. Then I'm looking through my own lens. I'm just looking at myself. Mm-hmm. Right? But while Scripture is a lens, it also should be a mirror. Yeah. Uh, uh, James 1, 22 to 24. We all know that Scripture. It says a guy, a guy that reads the Scripture and doesn't do what it says is like a man who looks in the mirror and walks away and immediately forgets what he looks like. It's like, actually, we have to apply the scripture. And it should apply to us first. Like I said, when we read those characteristics in uh, 1 Timothy 3, those qualifications, if I'm not qualified, if I've got a problem with one of those things, it's an invitation to go before God. Because that thing now is a mirror. I'm saying this, this, this. Actually, I'm not that. Uh, It's an invitation for me to go before God and say, God, can you help me with this? You doing okay? So let's work through those, those character qualifications real quick, right? 1 Timothy 3, um, I'm going to just, I'm going to open my Bible here for a second, it's about time, I heard somebody say, the Bible says, so we spoke a lot at, a lot at uh, RCC Advance, most of you were there, about redeeming leadership, right, mm-hmm. we need a redeemed view of leadership, and 1 Timothy 3 verse 1 simply starts like this. Here is a trustworthy saying. If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. And I liked how uh, um, uh, the guy that wrote The Branch. Oh, Michael Eaton. Michael Eaton, I'm sorry. Michael Eaton described it. He said, he who desires the work of being an overseer, he who desires the work of being a shepherd, (coughs) desires a noble task work right so it's not about title and position yeah. it's back to that thing of like actually sheep without a shepherd and and the way we said it at, at uh, rcc advance was this if you desire the task of seeing people come to healing and wholeness you desire a noble task if you desire the work of seeing of helping people come to maturity and fullness in christ you desire a noble work yeah. does that make sense so when we see that, when we understand that, we've got, we have to have a redeemed view of leadership. Like actually that has to redeem what we see, right? And, and if we do that, then it's a noble thing. And it, it feels like, and I said this at RCC Advance, I don't want to rehash it, but it feels like when we can see this, we can restore the honor and the dignity of being asked to be in leadership rather than I get asked to be in leadership and it's like, ah, another thing I have to do. It's a noble thing. Yeah. Are you doing all right? Yeah. That's cool. And so it goes on and says, now the overseer, and we can just take that overseer, leader, we can swap those words out, right? And so Timothy says, the elder, the overseer, must be above reproach. That's different from unapproachable. Yeah. Wow. Those are two different words. Yeah. Right? Above reproach simply means this. I live my life in such a way that nobody needs to ask me a question. It's yeah. like it, my life is out in the open. My life's an open book. Yeah. Does that make sense? What you see is what you get. I don't have a public persona and a private persona. Yeah, that's yeah. Good. Yeah, good. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. What I am in public is what I am in private. Authenticity, Authenticity is a good word. Yeah. It means I live, my way in such a, I live my life in such a way that nobody has any questions about my life, my marriage, my finances. Mm-hmm. It's just it's obvious. It's out there. It's out in the open. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? No shadows, no question marks. That's a high standard. That's a very, that's a very high standard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But let me say this. There's a difference between privacy and secrecy. Yeah. Yeah, Alright? Mm-hmm. Things done in secret are dangerous. But we all should be able to have a private life. Yeah, 
Every, everybody in this room knows I love motorcycles. Everybody in this room knows I ride motorcycles. But you don't see me post those things on social media. Because for some people in other countries, a Harley Davidson costs the same as a house. And so my friends and family and those around me are like, of course we know TK rides. He uses Harley illustrations all the time in church. We assume he rides a Harley, he doesn't make those stories up. Does that make sense? So there's a difference between private. I'm private about that. I'm careful with who I tell. But there's just no secret. Does that make sense? Accountability can only be given. It can never be demanded. Accountability can only be given. It can never be demanded. Leaders that have fallen often say something like this. I had no one I could talk to. There was a guy in Colorado Springs couple years back, um, major national leader that fell, right? Be in a big way, spending church money on cocaine and prostitutes. That guy had seven or eight, that guy had seven or eight accountability committees around him. Can you see why I say accountability can only be given, it can never be demanded? The one thing serving six years in the military taught me is you can get away with about anything if you try hard enough. Mm. You, can, you can find your way around any system if you try hard enough. And so that's why it can never be demanded. It can only be a value to me yeah. that I'm accountable to those around me. Yeah. Does that make sense? Because otherwise you can have all the committees and all the oversight. Mm. Right? So yeah. you're saying all those committees can't necessarily demand it from you unless you're willing to... Unless you're open and vulnerable. And that's your thing. Because you can ask me how it's going and I can be like, great. Yeah. You kind of kick the dog on the way there. Yeah. So we, don't about, dog, so we don't have a dog. We don't have a dog. Good illustration. Yeah. So what about when you're in an organization, um, anything, whether it's church, work, uh, hobbies, say you have a leader that's, that's false brain in certain places and he's not giving that accountability to us, giving us the ability to hold him accountable. What about, what do you do then? I mean, can you necessarily demand it? No, I'm, I'm saying for us. Okay. I'm saying for me as an individual, I, I can only give accountability. For accountability to be authentic accountability, I can only give accountability. Nobody can demand it of me. Right. And let me, and let me you'll hear me say this often as well, right? We, I'm a pastor, I'm not a policeman. So if I ask you how you're doing and you say, okay, I'm going to believe you. I'm not going to go and investigate. Yeah. If you tell me something, I ask the question and you tell me something, I'm not going to go and investigate. I parented my kids like that as well. Mm-hmm. If, if I ask you something and you tell me, I'm going to believe you. God's called me to be a father, not a policeman. Right? right? Yeah. But there's a thing here. There's accountability here. There's a value here. Yeah. Then I better hear from you first before the principal calls me. <laughs> That's accountability. Does it make sense? Yeah. Because then when the, when the principal calls me, I'm not surprised. I'm like, yeah, I'm working through it, etc. Yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? And so the same thing in, in leadership, the same thing in, in business. Just be vulnerable. Be accountable. Don't cheat. Don't hide things. Yeah. Does that make sense? And even that thing that you always say, you, it's that you look at it as, as a friend or a foe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always say this, accountability, and when, we, when we teach that as a thing, and we might even get to it, but accountability, friend or foe. See, a lot of people would say that's a foe, that's an enemy. You're trying to hold me accountable. No, it's a protection. Yeah. It's your biggest friend. Yeah. Right? Let me, something that I hammer so much with these young kids, temptation is not sin. Yeah. How do we know that? Well, the Bible tells us Jesus was tempted and was found without sin. Yeah. So we know temptation is not sin. It's in that temptation phase that there's an accountability piece. Yeah. Hey, I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with that. Right. Does, that make, does that make sense? Yeah. It's made me think of that. What was that movie, School Fight? Huh? Fight Club? No. no it's, it was a, it's a, it was comedy. a comedy. It's not and the, teach, and the teacher, the teacher, the teacher says to the teacher says to the principal that she's she's hooked on cocaine. And so the principal, the, principal says, the principal says to her, you have to stop that. And she goes, why? Because it's a gateway? He goes, because it's the finish line. <laughs> and that, 
But isn't that but isn't that the challenge, right? It's like when you're there, nobody can help you. When you're there, when you've sinned, now it's sin. Does that make sense? When you've had the affair, when you've got the girl pregnant, that's like then you're there. Then uh, there's no magic wand. There's no fairy dust. It's in the temptation phase that somebody can say, well, let me stand with you, bro. You know what I mean? Let me talk you through it. Let me give you some biblical counsel. Let me reference some stuff. Mm. Let's stand and pray together. Mm. Does that make sense? And that's, that's, what, that's part of that thing of accountability. But it can only be offered. It can never be demanded. Because I don't know the temptations you face. I know the temptations I face. Are you doing all right? It's a protection for us, friends. It's a protection. So that's the time to come. Come early. I always say this. Most people are... It's probably blaze. The, the, the thing is, is that okay? We just, we just have to, we just have to work it out, man. We just have to work that, that accountability thing. We have to work it out. We have to see it as a protection. Does it make sense? But it's not to everyone too, right? No. And I, I've used, and I've used this, I've used this illustration last year. And I, and I do have to do something different with my vacation this year, and we are, we are planning that. But last year I went a full 12 months and then took vacation, right? And I realized at my age I just I can't do that anymore. You, you know what? Time's on my side, bro. Because you know what's going to happen to you one day? You're going to be 59. I'm taking a vacation in three years. Okay. Okay. But one time's on my side, bro. Father time. You ain't going to do. Father time is... Seven billion and oh, or whatever it is. He ain't father time ain't gonna lose, bro. Uh, what was I saying? Quit distracting me, you nerds. Ah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So, I just, so, so last year before I went on vacation, I, I realized I was angry. And listen, anger is different to frustration, right? Yeah? Anger is different to frustration. I realized I was angry. I didn't do anything about it. But I went to Ty, just real quick, because Ty's in the church. He's the team leader of NCMR. He's a mate. I'm accountable to him. I went to Ty after churches, just a quick conversation. I just said, bro, I just want to be accountable to you. I want you to pray for me. I'm struggling with anger. And so he asked me a few questions, exactly what I said. I hadn't acted on it. And, he's, and this is what he said to me. He said, he said I think you're tired. He said, I want you to go away. I know you've got vacation coming in a couple of weeks. I want you to go on vacation. When you come back, if you're still angry, we're going to have to have a different conversation. Which is the other part of accountability, right? You need to be accountability, accountable to somebody that can change your life. Otherwise, I can be accountable to Taylor Birch. But when I'm accountable to somebody that has got the, the, the wherewithal to be able to say to me, bro, you're going to have to step down for three months. That's true accountability. Does it make sense? Husband of one wife. It's pretty self-explanatory, I hope. Yeah. Some have made this about divorce. And I want to say maybe it is about divorce. I'm just not 100% sure of it. I do think there's a tie between this scripture and verse 4. He must manage his own family well. And there's a reason for that in the Jewish tradition. And you see it if you read that scripture a little bit. In the Jewish tradition, the family is called the little church. And so that's why he's saying you must manage his own family well. Because he's saying if you, if you can lead the little church well, that qualifies you to come help me lead the big church. Does that make sense? Do so that's what... Right. Exactly. Yeah. So, and I think it speaks of team as well, being able to work in team. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Do you want to elaborate on that? Well, I just think a husband doesn't decide on everything and control and demand... Uh, he's got a team. He has a wife and his children. He, he learns to work in team, but still is called yeah. to be the, the the head of the home and make decisions. Yeah. But it's a, a thing of bringing people on team with you and being able to work in team. Very good. So it seems like more like when you read that scripture, it's about this. It's about, more than likely, it means there's an obvious skill in leading the family that will benefit you in leading the church, right? Okay, exactly. 
You know, it was funny when I worked in a, when I worked in uh, I worked at this big company in South Africa, and I was a, I was a sales rep, and when they were bringing new sales reps in, the boss would often say this to me: "He'd say, take this guy out, spend the day with, him, see what he's like with with people, you know." It's like kind of like I was like the unofficial, I wasn't the sales manager or anything, but they wanted to for me to judge what this guy was like. And my boss would always ask me this question, try and find out if he's cheated on his wife. It's a worldly company, right? Just a worldly company. And my boss was very worldly. But he wanted the answer to that question. And I never, I never asked him why. When I left the company, I said to him, Ian, why was that question so important to you? And he said this, if he'll cheat on his wife, he'll cheat on us. Faith, faithfulness in that thing qualifies you for leadership, right? I love the Marine Corps motto, Semper Fidelis. It means always faithful. It sounds like there's redundant language there, right? Because you can't be faithful sometimes. That's the very definition of being unfaithful. Does that make sense? You can't be like, well, I feel like it today. No, it's Semper Fidelis, always faith. Yeah. Do, you, do you believe that a female would be qualified in such a leadership position because they're not the head of the family? Um, yeah, leadership, yes. Eldership, we've got a problem because we've got biblical thing about eldership being male. But deacons, leading a connect group, leading a ministry, yeah. prophesying, teaching, Understand. all of those things, absolutely. And that's why I'm saying, I don't think it's so much necessary about that husband of one wife. It's about some of the things that Sandy spoke about. Are you, are you in team? Is there fruit from, from those things, fruit from your life? Make sense? Mm -hmm. I need to go quickly. Temperate, self-controlled, respectable. Simply means this, clear-headed in all situations. Yeah. I'm not going to lose my head when things yeah. go bad. Yeah. All right? Hospitable, open home, open heart. Yeah. We try to have people in our home before we have them on coming to family. And if we can't get that done, we do the first night of coming to family in our home. There's a reason for that. Hospitable. I, I, we've often had people say this to me, you know. They've said, I was, I was in my last church for 17 years. I never even knew where the pastor lived. So that's like the way we build, that's weird for us. Because we build in our home. Yeah? Yeah. I can, I can promise you this, you cannot build community from the pulpit. Yeah. You can preach about community all day. If you won't be with people and you won't have people with you, you won't be in their homes and have them in your homes, you will never establish community in the life of a church. Yeah. Able to teach. I need to go quickly here. Able to teach. This is one of the few skills mentioned. Yeah. Right? These are all character qualifications, except for this one, able to teach. Yeah. And I still don't think it means public preaching or public teaching. It means this, we should be able to open, leaders should be able to open the scripture and help somebody's life from the word of God. Yeah, yeah. That's what it means, able to teach. You come there, I've got a problem with my finances, let me tell you what the scripture says about finances. Yeah. I am, are we struggling with, husband and wife are struggling, let me open the scripture and tell you what the Bible says. Yeah. Does, that, does that make sense? Yeah. Good. The Bible says, exactly. Yeah. More probably it means that a leader should have a deep commitment to learning the word and leaning on the word. Right? Not all elders are preaching elders. One of the guys that had a super high impact on my life was a guy by the name of Doug McDonald at Glenridge, church of about a thousand people. I think he's preached there once in like 20 years. And he carried a, he carried a dining room table out into the middle of the thing where he was supposed to preach, got on the dining room table, sat cross-legged with his Bible in front of him, and spoke about dining room Christianity. Changed all our lives. You're doing right. Not given to drunkenness. Again, pretty self-explanatory. But, the flip side of that is the Bible doesn't expressly forbid drinking. It just says not given to drunkenness. Don't love wine. Don't be dweezed all the time. <laughs> There's also that thing of like if someone it's hard if someone's struggling with that. Exactly. I was just gonna get to that. Okay, sorry. No, no, but it is no but it is good. Now I had a guy in the church we led in in the church we led in Empangeni, we had a guy that really struggled with alcoholism. And we and we had one here for a season as well. And it's like 
The, ch the challenge with this is if you're a leader, if you're that guy's connect group leader or you're an elder in the life of the church and, and God puts it on that guy's heart in this instant, okay, you need to go see TK and he's going to pray for you and you, this thing is going to be dealt with now one time, once and for all. And he shows up at your house and you smell like alcohol. You see what I'm saying? That's, that's the tension for me in that, in that thing. It's like, because the Bible also says, don't cause another brother to stumble. So I want to, I want to say this to you as leaders. Uh, the Bible doesn't forbid drinking. It doesn't. It does say this, don't be given to drunkenness. But be wise. If you know a guy struggles with that, then sit and he's over at your house. That certainly is not the time. That doesn't make sense. Just be wise. And again, there's a difference between privacy and secrecy. You can be private about your stuff. I've got, got a buddy of mine in California. He's, he's a pastor. And he, well, he posts these photographs of, of like, his, his Bible and a glass of whiskey and a cigar. And he's like, I'm doing sermon prep. And I'm like, for me, I, 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 like, I'm not like, you know what I'm saying? It's like, are you trying to prove your liberty? Because if you're trying to prove your liberty, then you're really not free. I don't have to prove my liberty. I can live in it or not. Okay, but don't make me go there, please. Okay, here we go. Not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome. Listen again, you can have a firm grasp on the gospel, but be violent and quarrelsome. It's not, those are not good characteristics for a leader, right? Don't be violent, don't be quarrelsome, right? It simply means this, don't be impatient and aggressive. Be gentle. Uh... There was a there was a major church up in uh, up in the Seattle area, major church, internationally renowned speaker, but he got this. He got impatient and aggressive. And if anybody challenged his leadership, he would attack them, go after them publicly, staff meeting, whatever. I'm so grateful for his elders. His elders sat down with him and said, "You no longer qualify to be an elder in this church because these are qualifications for eldership." Uh, listen, qualifications for leadership are not like a one-time deal. Well, I qualified in 1973. Now I can live my life however I want. These are constant. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like, well, I was sober in 1973 when you asked me on to eldership. Now I'm drunk all the time. It's like, wait, actually, those are constants. You bring those with you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not a lover of money or dishonest gain. Mm. That simply means this, free from false motivation. Free from false motivation. Not in it for the fame, the position, or the title, yeah. or any other false motiv motivation. Glory to God. Huh? Glory to God. Yes, sir. Yeah. Solo Dio Gloria. Yes. 1 Timothy 3.10. So this is out of that text. But I, but I do love this. It says, they must first be tested. Mm. I've heard guys preach that different ways. I've heard guys preach this like I'll, I'll never have somebody on my, on my leadership team that I haven't corrected so that I can see how he responds to correction. Mm. I, I think that's a total abuse of the scripture yeah. because when it says tested, I think that's God testing us. Yeah. And we're going to talk about that on one of these sessions, the tests of ministry preparation. Mm. We're going to talk about that. And there's many, the loneliness test, the wilderness test. There's many of those tests that we will go through. These tests are for God to put people through. Not for me to manufacture. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. If they're godly tests, I want to say this. I think the test is faithfulness and fruitfulness. And we have to have both. We have to have both faithfulness and fruitfulness. If we only choose faithful people, we'll lock, we'll lock the church into a holding pattern. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If we choose people that are faithful, and you have to be faithful to produce fruit. Mm -hmm. If we choose people that are faithful and fruitful, we see the kingdom advance. Mm -hmm. Let them prove faithful and fruitful over time. Dudley would often say this. When he was unsure about a leader, he would say this, let's wait and see. Uh, and he wasn't talking about five minutes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it was a year or two. Mm -hmm. Anthony asked, people released into leadership prematurely has wrecked way more people than them being delayed and coming on a year or two late. We can risk when it comes to leaders, but we don't want to be desperate. Mm. You know, we, we were, not in my notes. Uh, we, uh, I'm finishing quickly. Last time we were up, 
but our elders get away up in the mountains. We sat in that room and we said, we feel like God is asking us to double this team in the next year. And there were five of us there. Now there's four of us. But we don't just ordain and pick people and make haste and risk and take chances. Right? Uh, not a recent convert speaks of spiritual maturity, not age. We're going to cover that a little bit later. You must be a good reputation with outsiders. Outsiders. You know the guy that brought me into ministry? Uh, he did this. He would... He would he, and when he brought me into ministry, it was full-time ministry. And he asked me for my boss's number that I worked for, my worldly boss at that company that I told you about. Yeah. And he called that guy and he said, sure, you know by now, I'd already told him, I'd already put my resignation in. We're bringing this guy into full-time ministry. He said, if this doesn't work out in three months' time, will you have him back? Reputation with outsiders. Mm-hmm. If your boss has been waiting to get rid of you, because you're late and lazy and disorganized and dishonest, then when the pastor calls and asks that question, would you take him back? He's like, not a chance. That's not a good reputation with outsiders. Yeah. That's, it's funny that the Bible makes that a qualification for leadership in the church, good reputation with outsiders. Yeah. Yeah. Doing okay? And it says this, so that he will not fall into disgrace or into the devil's trap. Let me tell you something, friends. The devil loves to discredit leaders. Because if he can discredit leaders, he discredits the church. Yeah. Yeah. I'm out of time. Okay. Next. Next week we'll something else. We'll send the notes. We'll send the notes. Yeah. Stop asking questions. <laughs> Right? Good. I'm right on time, right? 8.30? Is it? No. I left my watch at home. 8.40. 840. 840. Okay. Okay. Well, seeing as I'm already over, let's go through capacity. <laughs> no, now you're stretching our capacity. Now I'm stretching oh, your good. grace. That was good. Any thoughts, any questions? Real quick. I don't want to keep this going, but I do just want to... Yeah? Good. Father, we love you. We bless you. Thank you for these men and women, Lord, that give up time to come and learn about leadership, to, to want to advance the kingdom, Father. We just, I bless them, Father. Bless them for giving up their time, taking time away from their family, other things they could be doing. We just bless them now, Lord. And as we've said, Father, the goal of leadership is not to hammer stuff in, but to call it out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. These, these people here are here by invitation, Lord, and they're here because we saw something in them. I thank you for that, Lord. Help us. Help us as leaders. Help us as elders to call out, to call out gifting and calling, Father. We bless you now. Bless them as they go. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well done.